and like right now, yes, as long as we are you know, finally you know, decided to kind of push ahead with this Apache Ignite 3.0 project, there are so many changes that I think that it's quite impossible to digest and comprehend them by just reading the dev list. That's why even those, even, even though who will not be able to join this conversation today, we are going to make a recording, we are going to put this recording to the Apache Ignite Wiki page so that if somebody joins this project maybe later, they will be able to watch and understand what all those features described in the dev list or on the wiki pages basically mean. Right? And also, yeah, that's the conversation. It's not only a presentation, we also I hope that all of you guys who are on the call today, uh, feel free to unmute, feel free to ask questions, feel free to challenge us because well, well is, is one of our uh, old timers of the community and he decided to take over this project from the release management perspective. So he is going to uh, kind of tell you how we see this project, what should be the very first improvements, but also it's not a final right roadmap. There's something that we are preparing for the discussion. So your feedback, your collaboration is uh, anticipated and we're encouraging you to not, do not be shy, ask questions. You can probably watch and we can discuss it right now. You can probably join uh, a devil's conversation, conversation later, it's up to you. We'll start when you want, if any feature will be uh, too controversial, right? Yeah. And uh, I think that this time we will do, uh, usually uh, on our meetups, we ask all the questions after the presentation, but this time we will do um, breaks for the questions after each section. Mm -hmm. uh, so after each section, we will have 10 minutes for the questions and answers. And if something will be uh, too uneasy to, uh, to answer, um, I hope that we will go to the dev list and continue emailing. So let's start probably. And everyone who will join later uh, will be able to watch the video. All right, sounds good. Yeah, so just to add to this, I definitely want this to be an open discussion. Um, I don't have that many slides or anything, so I'm just going to go, you know, through some, um, basically through main goals of the release uh, and, uh, you know, some of the features that we already have in mind. Um, most of them already have been proposed on the dev list. And there are some IEPs already out there. So this is basically to, you know, kick off more massive discussion, I would say. So yeah, any questions, just jump in and ask. And, you know, let's talk about, about those features. Let's see if there are any objections, if there are any ideas how to improve that or anything so that that should be an open discussion for sure and yeah after each section we'll have several minutes for questions and at the end as well so we have hour and a half scheduled i think right for this yeah i don't know if we will use all of it or not or maybe it's not enough even i don't know we'll see how it goes um but anyway yeah so let's discuss and uh, if we don't have enough time we'll continue on devil list and um yeah so so with that uh so ignite 3.0 so as you probably guys know um we've been on ignite 2.x for uh for a long time uh and there are a lot of changes that community has been thinking about um you know in terms of usability improvements or something else that cannot be done in 2.x because of the API incompatibility or something, some, you know, these are major changes that cannot be done in 2.x. Um, so I've tried to kind of gather them into something uh, that can be presented and understand it. Um, and uh, basically used that to create a scope for 3.0. So the main goals are, uh, the main goals of the release are actually pretty simple. So first of all, there is a, there is a lot of cleanup work to do, right? 
we've you know we've created a lot of things. Some of the some of the features are not used, and this kind of things. I've, 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 uh, I will talk about in more detail uh, about this as well. So uh, second one is improve usability. Uh, this is one of the you know uh, pain points of the project. I would say based on my experience with our users. Um, Ignite is a great project. It has a lot of functionality. It can, you know, solve a lot of problems um, and address a lot of different use cases. Uh, but usability, unfortunately, suffers sometimes. Sometimes, some uh, to a certain extent, because it's just a complicated project. Uh, and again, it it addresses so many use cases uh, that sometimes it's not easy to understand how to approach a particular use case. So this is something that we want to address, uh, try to address in 3.0. And also modernization, like, uh, you know, uh, generally speaking, we have a lot of kind of legacy stuff in the project as well um, that we want to look at and see how we can maybe utilize like latest uh, protocols that have been invented in the last years or, you know, like, uh, integrate with the latest Java versions in a better way and these kind of things. So just look at all the things that, you know, that happened in, in the last several years and see how we can uh, benefit from this. Uh, so with that, I will go through, you know, particular changes that I'm seeing here uh, that can be done. So first of all, the cleanup. Uh, so that's probably the most obvious and that has to be done in 3.0 for sure. Uh, we have many things that should be genuinely removed uh, from the, uh, from the pro project. Um, first of all, that's all the deprecations that we have. Um, there are many of them, actually. If you look at, if you search for just deprecation, deprecated annotation in the, in the project, you will find a lot of stuff. Uh, and also we have like whole features deprecated, like, you know, um, IGFS, for example, or Hadoop acceleration. Uh, all those things are essentially deprecated. We have, you know, uh, call outs on the documentation that those features should not be used, but they're still on the product. Um, and this is the cleanup that we can, we can do in 3.0. That's a very, that's a good chance, you know, unique chance to do that. Uh, and, you know, there are many features like that that are de facto not used. You know, we have the expert-oriented programming integration, for example. No one uses that nowadays. Uh, we have scheduler, which is kind of, you know, um, which is a local functionality and it doesn't really make sense in the context of Ignite and, you know, it doesn't make sense as a, uh, to have it as a component of Ignite, at least in the way it is implemented. Uh, we can end up having something else um, that is more distributed and better suits, you know, uh, the project. But the, the the functionality that we have right now, I don't think it makes sense to have it um, in Ignite. Then there is messaging, you know, there is the Scala integration, uh, which is not really maintained and obviously it's not used. OSGI integration, this kind of thing. So, so there are many, there is actually the whole list. Uh, so if you go to the Apache Ignite 3.0 wiki page um, and scroll down a little bit, there is the cleanup list uh, that is currently proposed. Um, again, everything is up to discussion. You can, you know, uh, raise your hand and, you know, uh, if anything, if there is anything that you would like to keep, we can discuss that. And if there is anything uh, that you would like to add to the list, then definitely um, go ahead. And also there are some internal stuff as well, um, s s which creates issues, right? So first of all, the, we use unsafe a lot. Um, we use unsafe for two purposes. First is uh, the data storage, uh, which is obvious. Uh, we use it to allocate memory, you know, to store the data. And second, second one is for serialization. So all our marshallers, uh, including the binary marshaller, they use unsafe under the hood uh, to read the values from the, from the binary data and, and write them back. 
So unsafe, uh, as you probably know, is uh, is a, it's not deprecated, but it's it's a private API in Java, and uh, we are kind of not supposed to use it. And in the latest versions of Java, starting with Java 11, I believe, you have to enable explicitly enable certain modules um, to make it work. Otherwise, the, this functionality is not available and Ignite just cannot do anything. So um, on server side, it probably is not that big of a deal because uh, most of the server nodes are started with Ignite SH and in Ignite SH, we can uh, automate this process. Uh, just essentially, you know, detect which Java is used and if it's uh, Java 11 uh, plus, uh, set those properties, and provide them to the uh, Java process. Uh, but for client applications, uh, it's, uh, it's actually a big usability issue because if uh, someone uses Ignite on Java 11, uh, they actually have to provide those properties explicitly for their applications um, that embed Ignite clients. And it's not, there is no easy way to know what are those options and where to find them. So they have to go to the documentation. They have to Google for this, for those errors they get. And, you know, uh, maybe they will find this documentation page that we have. Maybe they won't. Uh, so it's, a, it's actually a huge um, usability issue. So unsafe, we should, uh, basically, we should uh, try to get rid of unsafe uh, going forward, replace it with something else. Uh, there are alternatives in Java, whether it's actually needed for celerization, that, that's a big question in the first place. Uh, it was used for performance reasons, I believe, but you know, it's probably need to be revisited. So um, unsafe has to be removed on the client side in the, in the short term, I believe, because as I said, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's quite a usability issue. On the server side, this can be done going forward in future releases. Well, and also if you if you let yeah. me interrupt you just for a moment, while you while you're staying and discussing the unsafe uh, related kind of inconveniences, I also want to highlight to the other guys who are uh, with us on the call that this all this this kind of uh, uns unsafe dependency on the client end prohibits or like or prevents us from using uh, yep. modern modern virtual machines like Graal VM. As you know, guys, Graal VM goes with uh, the native image capability when basically you can go ahead and uh, compile your Java application into kind of small binary thing. It doesn't require any uh, classical uh, Java virtual machine under the hood. And the goal of that Graal VM native image capability is just to bootstrap the start lifetime of the client applications, etc. And the issue is our thin clients or thick clients of Ignite right now is though is that those clients also utilize unsafe internally and we are not able to compile any Java, you will not be able to compile any Java application uh, for into the into the native image of Graal VM until we solve this problem. So if you already like let, let's let, let me ask the question to you folks. If you uh, are planning to use the native image capability of Graal VM in the nearest future, just uh, give me a, a thumbs up. You can write down, let's say, uh, any note in the, the chat window, because if you find out that there are so many people and application developers who already try, who already planning to use this native uh, image feature in the future, then probably the community needs to be uh, aware of that so that you can prioritize and uh, start contributing these capabilities sooner than later. So just a bit more context for you folks of why the unsafe is also, this unsafe dependency needs to be solved from the client side uh, in the long term, because we want to work, yeah. work without any issues with Graal VM native image capabilities. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, so that might involve other changes as well. So it's probably not the only issue for uh, for the uh, native image compilation, but sure, yeah, and safe is one of those things that we have to address in that in that regard as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, apart from a safe, there are some other things. You know, we have this optimized marshaller, which is kind of um, 
which is used within the binary marshaller in a in a weird way. Um, if if there is like an externalizable object, it, binary basically falls back to the optimized, and then never it never goes back. Uh, so it creates quite a uh, unexpected behavior sometimes. Uh, we use compute internally for um, some of the tasks like monitoring and this kind of things. Uh, so instead of having some, you know, internal, instead of using like internal messaging directly, uh, which is probably the right way to do this, uh, we kind of use compute. Uh, so the, the, these are kind of things, you know, where we did some shortcuts, I guess, um, and they create some difficulties, uh, technical difficulties. Sometimes they create unexpected issues, uh, you know, the compute engine changes and those um, monitoring tasks, for example, they start to execute in, in a different way and their behavior changes for some reason. So it's all unexpected. It's all kind of, it's, it's basically technical debt that we have. And uh, again, 3.0 has, uh, gives us unique opportunity to, um, to reduce it. So some of those internal um, mechanisms should also be revisited and uh, uh, reworked where possible and uh, where needed. So, and as I said, there is uh, the whole list of cleanup items uh, on the wiki page. So feel free to go ahead and take a look and, you know, um, object if you have any objections or uh, add your own items if you have some ideas in that regard. So um, any, any questions on this one? Let's uh, let's discuss if you guys have any questions or any ideas, suggestions. Go ahead uh, and mute. And... Well, I think we have a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Well, I, it's, yeah, I can just repeat it. It's Glenn. I was just saying that uh, I okay. thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, but is messaging, messaging API, that's used for data center replication internally, correct? Under the covers? Uh, no. So messaging, uh, so there is... Um, so the messaging API is basically uh, an attempt to expose the internal messaging as public API. Right. So, okay. so we have the internal messaging, which is used for everything, not, not only for application, but for right. virtually everything. Right. Um, and uh, we also have the messaging API, which essentially exposes this functionality to the public API. Right, okay. Yeah. So, so I, I personally love having the messaging API exposed to me, I think, between a client and server, or server to server, I think it's it's a good feature to have as we you know, try to move towards a more real time approach or more reactive, you know, paradigm. So less synchronous calls, more async calls embedded in everything. Uh, I think uh, that should be growing, not not being removed. But uh, you know, obviously there's some other reasons for deprecating some features. But that would be my vote for you know getting better on messaging and, and not less. Yep. Yeah, we actually had this, uh, there was kind of a brief discussion on the dev list, I think, and the same thing was brought up. So um, the thing is that uh, I, I believe this should be done on compute level. And that's actually also one of the, you know, kind of this uh, uh, event-based processing and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of reactive processing is something that probably we should look at as well. I don't have I don't have a slide for this uh, yet because it's there are you know more questions than answers there, uh, but I will probably start at you know, like a separate discussion on this um, in in the near future because basically um, we do need some we do need such functionality. Messaging doesn't really provide this; it doesn't provide any guarantees. Um, you know, it just basically you you can send a message and you can have a listener. Um, if it fails, if it fails, again, no guarantees. Um, so it, it doesn't really provide any substantial value in my experience and people don't really use it that much. And for that reason, it's not really maintained. Um, so uh, the approach, the correct approach here in my view would be is to look at the use cases uh, and see how we can properly address this. My, my guess would be that this messaging API that we have right now doesn't really do that. <laughs> so uh, we probably should just come up with something that, you know, would be actually useful. 
so yeah, those reactive use cases and you know event based processing use cases they definitely exist, right. and we definitely like something in that regard um, okay. yeah that and that should be addressed. I don't think that should be addressed within the messaging API uh, though because it's very low level API and there is nothing there is not much we can do actually it again it just exposes this internal company this public API. I don't think it's just the right way, but I do agree that we we should address those use cases. I guess the, the only comment I'd add to that is that messaging as a paradigm is fairly well understood. Now, whether we, our implementation matches that expectation, that's a, that's a great question. Yep. Um, so, you know, being more holistic and doing it right, you know, as you say, maybe compute is the right, you know, basis for doing this. But then when we do it right, we should, try to give people an API that they're familiar with because then we then they just get more comfortable with stuff so maybe we have to tear it down to build it back up but I would like at some point to have something that people who think of messaging are are comfortable with yeah yeah I absolutely agree um, I think this should be like a separate discussion on that um, and as I said you know I, I will I will start it and uh, this is something we should definitely address uh, it, it, when I say compute, by the way, it's not necessarily compute. It might be even something something new. What I what I mean by compute is that it probably should be a more high level API, which is designed specifically for that. Um, it 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 can be even something entirely new. Um, okay, we which, have another question in the chat. Sure. About yeah, configuration. Ahead. Configuration is the. Uh, to be removed list for discussion, remove current data structures, lock, uh, semaphore, set, queue, cache-based implementation leads to configuration issues. What are the configuration issues? Uh, say it again. So uh, We are planning, uh, we, we were speaking about removing uh, some current data structures. Mm -hmm. Lock, semaphore, set, queue. Uh, because that leads to configuration issues. And what are these issues? So the data structures, um, so the thing with data structures is that, um, so again, this is, um, um, this is up to discussion. That's, uh, that's actually a good point. Uh, data structures is something we should look at um the the problem with them in my view is that again this is kind of a shortcut uh they were built on top of caches which is probably not the best implementation and uh the way it's implemented causes causes some of those issues around configuration and everything because you know like if you build some data structures on top of a cache the first question is how you configure it right because there is an underlying cache and uh the cache is configured then. Like what are the properties that should be exposed? And we have those collection configurations and these kind of things, which are not, you know, which are not really intuitive in the first place. And also, um, uh, we don't really know if all the configurations that should be there are exposed and, you know, maybe some of them are, uh, should be removed. Uh, basically, I think that we should look at the implementation uh, of the data structures and see if we can um, rework them going forward so they do not so that they are not based on caches in this way. You know, maybe they should be based on something. Uh, that, uh, we can have like a lower level abstraction for the data storage or something, and then build APIs on top of that. But uh, my point is that the, the the way it's implemented right now. Uh, is probably the root cause of uh, the issues. So I don't think we should remove them, um, at least in 3.0, uh, but we can definitely look into how we can rework them to make more usable and, um, and also more performant, I think, because, you know, uh, again, the way they build, they currently they rely on caches and it's basically kind of additional layer, uh, which also affects performance as well or at least might affect potentially, I don't know. My, my thinking, my thinking on the data structures is that 
we definitely should not uh, hurry up and uh, remove yeah. them from the product, even though someone, uh, some community member men added them to this list. Uh, I think that, uh, so, so right now, guys, some of you might know that we are undertaking another activity. We are trying to modularize Ignite. So generally, we are trying to define the core capability, the core module of Ignite that goes with essential features like storage, SQL, etc., and everything else which is not like which is secondary, like data structures, can be uh, uh, turned into a module or extension. And so probably, probably, instead of you know removing and replicating this capability for sure, we can uh, uh, extract it to a separate module. And then, depending on the community interest and on the number of contributors we have, someone can take over and uh, start kind of improving these uh, data structures and do other internal optimizations. That's just my thinking. Yep. Yeah, that's actually a good point, by the way. So some of the components that we have, they can be externalized. Basically, we have like a bunch of integrations, which are currently part of Ignite. And um, there is a really great effort on moving them into like external repositories with external, you know, with separate life cycles and all that. Uh, and that's actually a good thing because we, we should try to keep Ignite to be Ignite, right? <laughs> all, those, all those integration companies, they can be separate. And uh, this kind of data structures actually can be one of those integrations as well but again this is this is all up to discussion and we can we can we can talk about this in more detail on uh, on the dev list i don't think we should remove them um, right away at least i think they should stay for now uh, we can look at the implementation we can look at the configuration issues that we might have with them and uh, we can also look at whether we can move them uh, into external uh, project as well and I think that's the answer for the question uh, which we have in the chat about uh, using queues and semaphores and locks in the projects. Yep, yep. Right, so... Let's move uh, forward uh, because yeah. we have limited time. Yes, yes, sure. Um, so, uh, talking about configuration. <laughs> so, configuration is basically one of the... Uh, again, if we talk about usability, uh, again, mo most of the big changes are around usability. Um, because that's, I think that's something we should definitely improve uh, as soon as possible. So configuration is one of the uh, biggest kind of pain points that we have right now for several reasons. Uh, so first of all, it's, uh, um, it's basically kind of a mix of uh, podgos and uh, uh, functionality items like filters, you know, SPIs and this kind of thing. So there are many, many places um, in the configuration there where you can provide your own implementations of something, right? This is really flexible uh, and this has its own, you know, uh, advantages. However, um, this creates issues as well. So starting with the, with the fact that you have to deploy the logic for that. Sometimes it's not needed. Um, so it complicates the configuration, sometimes unnecessarily. And uh, also it creates a whole set of requirements for code deployment. So if you have like a custom filter, you have to deploy it explicitly manually on every node. And if it's not deployed, Ignite just cannot deserialize the configuration and it just fails essentially. Um, which is which is not a good usability. So at least those two things should be decoupled somehow. And uh, I think the logic items should be minimized as well. Uh, because again, if we talk about SPIs, I don't think there are a lot of cases when new SPIs are created. It is possible and there are some use cases like that, but it's quite rare. And uh, uh, again, this should be, the, those two things should be decoupled from each other. Um, so then we, all, we also use the legacy XML format, format, it's a Spring XML, even Springs does not really endorse this format anymore. They use annotations and this kind of things. Um, and we still kind of rely on it. Uh, and not only it's a legacy format, it also brings the whole Spring dependency just for that, uh, which seems to be an overkill as well. 
Uh, and uh, then even more importantly, there are some um, usability issues around the fact that we have a static configuration file and uh, we have runtime changes uh, that can be applied to the cluster. Uh, so, and the question here is what happens to the configuration file? What do we should do with the configuration files when we update something in runtime? Uh, what should happen after the cluster restart? Should we apply the configuration file uh, in its original way that it was provided or should we somehow apply those runtime changes on top of it? So there are many questions uh, that arise here and uh, we don't really have clear answers. <laughs> um, this comes from the fact that initially all the configuration was static. We didn't have any functionality for runtime updates. Um, and essentially, you know, we just, we just had a configuration file and that's it. But then we add a bunch of stuff, a uh, bunch of different items that could be updated dynamically without the downtime. Uh, and uh, eventually it created a little bit of a mess of how we process this. And uh, to make it worse, there is a difference between persistent and non-persistent clusters. Uh, essentially for persistent clusters, all the updates, they are also persisted in the Metastore and they can be reapplied on the startup. And the way they're reapplied is also not uh, super transparent. And uh, for non-persistent clusters, they don't have, that don't have any persistent data regions. Uh, nothing is actually saved on disk. So if you have any runtime changes, changes and then you restart the cluster, they're actually lost. Uh, so all this, as I said, is a little bit of a mess here um, that needs to be cleaned up. So, so the proposal that is uh, currently there, it's uh, proposal number 55. You can, uh, you can look it up on the wiki. So essentially uh, the general idea is to create kind of a unified configuration uh, that addresses all those things. Uh, and uh, we also propose to switch to a different format. There is this Hawkon format, uh, which comes from, uh, uh, from Lightband or TypeSafe. Um, and it's basically a JSON based format, but it's, uh, um, it's you know, uh, it's updated to be better suitable for this kind of configuration purposes. Uh, so it's essentially a format specifically designed for configurations. It supports uh, JSON. It also supports its uh, modified JSON, which, uh, you know, removes a lot of different unnecessary uh, tokens from there, like, uh, you know, those brackets and all the things that we have in the required in JSON that are not required here. So it, the configuration looks a little bit more lightweight, I would say. And it also can be, uh, you can also use properties files as well. And I will show how we can actually use that for our purposes. So um, uh, we will have a clear life cycle of, what, of how it works. So essentially, instead of having static configuration files that are attached to the nodes, uh, we will have like actions that are applied uh, to the cluster. And uh, you, can, you can start a cluster with the, with, with, with the configuration file, but this configuration file essentially exists only in, the scope, only in the scope of the startup action, right? And then you can also apply different changes in runtime and this kind of thing. So there is no file that exists in the scope of the node. Uh, it is just used for a, for a startup, or you can also apply some changes dynamically and provide it as a, as a configuration file as well. And uh, configuration should also always be persistent. So when you start with the, uh, providing some configuration, this has to be saved uh, in the meta store of the cluster and then reapplied if you restart. So if you think about it, it's basically how uh, all the databases work, right? Uh, if, you, if you start a My, MySQL database, for example, you will probably have some basic configurations there. Um, for networking and stuff, but most of the things are applied in runtime. You create tables, you create databases, you configure them. Um, 
you can do many, many things. And all that is done after you actually started the server. If you restart the server, it's all there. <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, so we should act, we should we should follow the same the same approach, uh, generally speaking. Uh, so just a couple of examples uh, to uh, demonstrate how it might look like. Again, this is this is all um, that all this might change, uh, especially if we talk about detail. But the it probably shows the idea. Uh, so let's say we have like a configuration file uh, which is called ignite.hawkon, and it configures a couple of caches there. So that's how the format looks like, by the way. So it basically, as I said, it's kind of a simplified JSON, which is more uh, human readable. Um, and then you can, let's say, start with Ignite with this configuration file. So we also will need to create some kind of tool. Uh, we can call it Ignite CTL, for example, um, or we can come up with a different name, of course, as well. Um, uh, but the tool has to be there to support all those different actions, right? To start the cluster, to stop the cluster, and also to update the configuration in runtime. And to update the configuration in runtime, uh, we can essentially just, you know, uh, provide certain property and provide a new value for it. So for example, if we want to create a cache, we can do, we could use this Ignite CTL as well, providing the configuration for, a, for this new cache, right? So we do cluster, the cache is that new, and then provide the um, property values that we want to provide. Uh, and then, you know, we can also uh, update certain, uh, uh, certain runtimes uh, values as well, like uh, out adjust for baseline, for example. We can set it false or we can set it to true. And as you can see, we can actually uh, um, use properties format for this kind of hierarchical, hierarchy configuration, which is very useful. Right, because we can, if you, if let's say we can, uh, uh, we will create an ability to update number of backups, right? So we will just do uh, cluster that caches that partition that backups equals two, right? So we can access any individual property in this whole, you know, JSON hierarchy as a prop using this properties format. Um, that's what. That's what Hawken format does for us. So we don't have to do anything for this. Uh, so this is one of the very useful features, you know, why I think this format is very, is very suitable. So you can provide the whole configuration as a, as a JSON file, but then update a G individual property or maybe a couple of individual properties using properties format. So it's very, seems to be uh, very convenient, a very good format for this. Well, and I have a Any question on this one. Yeah, 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 really quick question. I do know that you've been doing an extensive research on this uh, new format. Uh, do you have any examples of other uh, big projects uh, of the Apache Software Foundation or like un affiliated with Apache Software Foundation that, they, that have already switched to this format? I just want to, I'm just curious, what's the adoption rate of this format? Is it getting traction or? Is it still kind of a new thing and uh, do you expect that that's, that's the future? I'm not sure about Apache projects, to be honest. Nothing, nothing comes to mind. Uh, I think it initially uh, came from whatever Lightband does. They have this plane framework. I think that was the first one where it was adopted and probably something else as well. I mean, um, I think it, it, in my in my understanding, it's uh, it's uh, it's relatively new in terms of adoption, at least. I don't know if when it was created, but uh, but yeah, it's quite new in terms of adoption. But essentially, uh, based on my research, there are two options. It's either this or um, uh, YAML, which is used by Kubernetes. Um, but YAML, I mean, I personally just like this one more, <laughs> first of all. Uh, and uh, second of all, I think this uh, ability to, the, the fact that it supports different formats, including JSON and including properties file format is very useful for our purposes. 
I'm not so sure it matters for much, Dennis, but uh, Tibco uh, has is encouraging the use of Hocon mm -hmm. format. So yeah. I like I like this. Yeah, I like this format. It's uh, neat and clean. Uh, and the last couple uh, last couple of uh, weeks, I've been working with one of our contributors who uh, is developing Ignite and Micronode integration. In the Micronode format, it's not a uh, it's not the Hakon one, but it, it reminds me, it, 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 it looks the same at least. You also can create just a plain text file. And in that text file, you can specify micro node configuration parameters in the way you are showing with uh, Hakon. Uh, my, 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 the other question would be then, uh, what uh, level of support should we do? Let's say like with Spring XML configuration, what happened? Generally, we up, it's possible, you know, just to define Spring, like that configuration in XML because all our configuration files follow uh, a specific protocol, like some convention, right? So you need to create your Java files, you need to name your files, or you need to name your methods, setters and getters using a specific approach. And after that, you will be, uh, it will be possible to, uh, let's say, uh, provide a Spring XML configuration. Uh, do we need to follow any special, let's say, naming convention for the whole con on their uh, API end? Like, how does it look like? I mean, the, the format itself does not create any requirements, obviously. So you can you can do anything. Where we can, where we whether we want to um, have a, some kind of schema that would be validated against the configuration that someone provides. Um, that's a question because um, there is a trade-off obviously you know if, if it's schemaless it's a little bit easier to add configuration parameters and these kind of things um, if it's uh, but at the same time there is no validation uh, so you know this is this 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 is more about implementation of how this configuration is processed so the format itself is just, uh, you know, what, what they provide is the format itself and also like a very lightweight library to, um, uh, to parse it. And uh, it essentially converts everything into like maps of parameters uh, in a convenient hierarchy API, this kind of thing. And what right. happened next, let's say, let's say I, I, cre I created uh, a configuration in this format and then what does, how, how does the parser works Will it take? Will it, will it use uh, some reflection mechanism? Let's say to map. Let's say this cluster baseline configuration into sp specific project configuration file, like project project bins. How do how does this transformation works internally from this uh, string configuration? Let's say to to a subset of uh, Java classes. No, it doesn't create projects. It creates just you know set of values. You know, I don't remember the exact format, but you can think of it as a map of like map of properties. I don't remember how they provide the hierarchy of that, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah. But essentially, it's not it's 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 not a podja. It's not a it's not a podja podja that would um, conform with this certain schema or anything. It's just uh, uh, just an abstract you know set of values essentially. Uh, in our case, we can. You know, we can, uh, first of all, they will be stored. Uh, we will essentially just store them in the meta store and all the components will uh, look up the certain configuration parameters from there um, based on what they need and apply them. That, that's how I think it should work. Whether we want to have podges on top of that or not, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't think it's impossible. We can, we can look into that. Um, that would be outside of this library, outside of the format. Uh, this is probably something we can do on our own. Uh, should not be too complicated, but, uh, format itself obviously does not do that. All right. Sounds good. So schema handling. So, um, again, one of the big discussion items <laughs> uh, that we've been having for the last couple of years, I think, is how we work with uh, data schemas. Uh, and again, I mean, we've, uh, 
we've been adding new features on top of other features for the last uh, several years. Uh, and that also created a little bit of mess here as well. Uh, so uh, the major problem is that the schema handling approach that we have is not unified across different components of the product. Uh, so first we have caches uh, that on their own are actually schemaless. You can just put, you know, different objects there. Uh, they don't, they don't specify any requirements for the data types that are stored there in those caches. They don't, uh, and they obviously don't specify any requirements for, you know, fields that you have on those objects and those things. So that's, uh, that's kind of the first layer. And then we have the binary protocol, which uh, creates schemas when it serializes the data. So it's not related to data storage. It's just outside of the uh, data storage itself. It is created for anything, schema for anything that is being serialized. Uh, whether it's uh, something that actually will be stored in the data storage or not. Uh, and those schemas are completely automatic. So if you update the classes, you know, uh, Ignite will serialize them and detect that there is a new schema, there are some new fields or something, and will create those new schemas automatically. And those schemas, they cannot be manipulated manually. So you cannot remove a schema, you cannot, you know, manually specify a schema for something. Uh, so that's automatic process. And again, it's uh, outside of the data storage. And then there is SQL that is created explicitly uh, and defined, like, defined explicitly uh, on top of a cache. Um, and again, it's uh, decoupled from the binary schema, right? And uh, um, the cache itself is schemaless. So it all creates this inconsistency between those, uh, uh, be between those three things, right? And um, many questions arise, like what happens if we, what we should do if we add a field into, uh, into the SQL schema, the, like the alter table? What should happen with the binary, uh, binary protocol schema? Um, how we can uh, protect ourselves from, uh, uh, protect the cache from some data that is uh, not compliant with the schema? What will happen if you know, uh, something is, is inserted and it's not, um, it's not compliant with the SQL schema that this cache has? And that's, there, there are many issues that we have there. Uh, these are just some of the examples. And uh, again, the approach that is proposed here is again to unify all that, right? To have a unified mechanism that would uh, work for all the components within the product. Uh, and also uh, we want to make sure that schema is attached to the data storage, right? So essentially um, we can have a one-to-one -one mapping between a cache and the schema. Right, so for every cache, there is a schema. So instead of uh, having schemaless caches, we can have caches that have schemas, right? So when you create a cache, you specify what would be the schema for the cache. What is the data type? Uh, what are the fields there that you expect? Um, you, we can probably do this based on some uh, project class, for example, right? but it has to be specified during the cache creation. And data that you have in the cache is always compliant with that, with that schema, right? So if you uh, in, try to insert something that is not compliant with the schema, we can throw an exception or uh, um, just fail, you know, uh, to update the data or update the schema. And obviously if schema is updated, then data has to be manipulated as well. It has to be, uh, we, we have to make sure that it is compliant. And we also can, there was like a little bit of discussion around uh, whether it should be automatic or not, like the, in terms of schema evolution, uh, whether we should uh, add more fields. Like if you, if you add uh, an object that is compliant with the current schema, but has some more fields there, right? So you had fields A and B, and now you insert an object that has A, B, and C. So A, B, A, and B are correct. They are compliant with the current schema, but there is also field C, uh, which is just a new one. So what should we do in that case? 
So um, basically one of the proposals is that we can have both schema first and schema last, last approaches, right? So in the, for schema first, it would work as I described. Uh, you specify the schema manually when you create the cache and then all the data must be compliant with the schema and you cannot have new fields there unless you update the schema. And with schema last, everything is um, uh, derived from the data itself. So you don't specify uh, the schema manually, but it's derived from the first insert, essentially. And then if you have an object that has more fields, it's also applied automatically. So it's more automatic process. But again, the cache has the schema at all times anyway. And if you try to insert something that is not compliant, like if you have a field that is of a different type, for example, then you will not be able to do that anyway, even though you did not specify schema manually. Uh, so just, just to demonstrate this, uh, so essentially you can have, uh, you can create a table uh, with certain fields, right? Let's say it's ID, name, last name, and the zip code initially. And then you do some manipulations with the schema. You add a column, you remove a column, and then you add one of those columns back. Uh, and what happens is that the actual tuple that we store in the data storage uh, is also updated, right? So the data, as I said, is always compliant with the schema. So if you remove the field, uh, then we uh, remove the fields from those tuples as well. Um, it's, it's a question of implementation, of course, how this will happen. Uh, whether we will just not give access to those fields and then clean up them in the background somehow, or um, that's obviously up to discussion. But uh, uh, the point is that for the user, at least, the data must be compliant uh, uh, with the schema. So if you remove last name field from the schema, for example, you cannot read this last name field anymore from the data that you have there. And uh, in case of uh, schema first approach, you cannot insert it as well. And also what we can do with this approach, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is pretty neat, is that we can have this uh, kind of class agnostic mapping, uh, kind of lightweight uh, uh, ORIM basically out of the box. Um, so if you, have a, if you have a table with let's say five fields, ID, name, last name, zip code, and, and the state. Uh, what we can do is we can deserialize those tuples uh, that we have in the storage into different classes with different uh, set of fields, right? So you can have a person class with just ID, name, and last name, and you can have a rich person class with all five fields. And with, then we can have an API that reads um, uh, the data based on the class that you provide, right? So you, you, we don't have to uh, be uh, attached to a single to, to a single class, to a single data type, when, data type when we read the data. Um, and we don't actually have to deserialize all the fields if we only need like two or three of them. Uh, so the binary protocol will be actually used only as a data storage in this, uh, only as a data storage format in this case. And the API for the binary, uh, the binary object API has, will have to be updated for this. Um, so we obviously need something similar to what we have right now in terms of, you know, you, you read the tuple from, from, from the cache and then you want to get some of the fields from there without deserialization. So we'll still have the similar API, but it probably will be a little bit different from what we have right now. So it's not, so binary object is not, is not really an object. It's rather a tuple that, you know, uh, a tuple in a data storage. Um, yeah, so any, oops, any questions on this one? On the schema processing? I like the idea. I'm wondering whether, you know, when, when you make all these schema changes, is there a view of maybe adding uh, other things like uh, extra elements in the, in the schemas, like foreign keys and views? And if so, you know, would you be careful about 
obviously it's an implementation question, but would you be careful about, you know, if there are four in T, if there are four in T, something, you, you may not be able to do it because you've got a four T reference. But if, it's even, if it's already included in a view, don't, don't remove it because it's included in a review, a view or those kinds of issues. Yeah, I mean, so this uh, this functionality is very low level, obviously, right? It's just basically uh, to clean up the way how we create caches, how we validate the uh, uh, the data that we have there, and all that, just to make sure that we always kind of understand what's what is going on. Uh, this will also be reflected um, in some tooling. Uh, essentially, at any point in time, we should be able to uh, see what what is the schema of the uh, of a certain cache and and then update it if we need to. So that's the whole point of this um, of this functionality. Um, everything else is you know it's is built on top of it. Um, like yeah, we have I don't know if there is any uh, plans to add those you know um, uh, foreign keys and other. Uh, SQL functionality like that. Um, it obviously creates uh, certain challenges when we talk about distributed uh, systems like like Ignite. But I, I think it's a little bit separate, a uh, little bit separate discussion. I don't think this, you know, having it having schemas on top of. I think it makes it only easier, right? <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of make it more compliant with with the uh, uh, relational approach and with SQL approach. Um, so I don't think it will create and it will create issues like that. I, I like the binding of the schema to uh, to tables and caches. I I just worry that there will be some people that want to have a, a sort of a, a generic bucket for holding stuff and they're mm -hmm. willing to live with the, the costs of that. Are you planning on having support for you know for at least like, even though we maybe default to schema bound. But maybe have support for a schema less implementation or what's your thought there? Yeah, so um, um, so if it's a bucket for stuff, <laughs> I think this stuff will always be deserialized. So essentially, we obviously will have uh, support for like blob types uh, for binary data. So if you uh, uh, serialize, serialize, serialize something into a blob and uh, save it into the cache, uh, then it will be there and you can read it and you can deserialize. So we can, um, so I think like uh, in terms of uh, underlying implementation, um, this can be done as a single field schema, which is a blob. So we can probably build some API on top of that, right? uh to make it more convenient for this kind of use cases so that that's actually a good point and um we can we can look into that in more detail yep all right so uh transactions um yeah so transactions is um a little bit less critical i believe however um uh, there are some very promising changes that we might have here. Uh, so uh, the transactional protocols that we use currently are a little bit outdated, I would say. Um, again, this functionality was created a um, long time ago, um, several years ago, and there are some new protocols that exist nowadays that are more advanced for these kind of purposes, um, mainly in terms of um, uh, split brain protection. So currently, uh, with Ignite, split brain is uh, is possible, and you can get data inconsistency because of split brain. There are workarounds. We have like we have those uh, you know topology validators. Um, we have uh, uh, segmentation event on discovery level, which kind of detects network segmentation so that you can do something with it, and you can provide some implementations on top of that. Um, but all that requires, you know, some effort, obviously, and some coding. And um, it all will depend on your environment, how exactly you will approach this. So it's, it might get a little bit complicated. So even though there are workarounds, um, 
it would be good to have split brain protection on protocol level. And again, there are protocols that actually support that. And also, maybe even more importantly, there is, we have this infamous partition map exchange uh, mechanism that, that kicks in every time topology changes, um, whether it's a, you know, a new node joins or a node, uh, some of the existing node leaves the topology. Uh, it essentially creates a cluster-wide process uh, that blocks all the transactions um, for the certain time and uh, does the remapping and uh, some other things. Um, and the problem is that um, if something goes wrong with partition map exchange, it can freeze the cluster, everything can go down. And uh, if you look at the, like, at the user list or stack overflow, um, I don't know, maybe the most of the issues that are related, related to like stuck cluster or um, something, you know, hanging uh, stuck transactions or something, they would most likely be related to partition map exchange. So that, that, is, um, that is the architectural uh, company that we have that creates a lot of instability in many cases. So this is something that also can be addressed. And the problem is that it, it is there in the first place, again, because of the protocols that are used for transactions. So they, they, uh, the implementation of transactional engine itself required to have this kind of global uh, synchronization process for every topology change. Uh, so there are protocols out there that can be used to address this. And first of all, they are kind of, uh, uh, they're being validated already. You know, uh, there is, uh, um, if you look at the different databases, you know, uh, they actually use like a handful of different protocols. Um, and those protocols have been validated for all those different uh, cases of split brain and everything else. So uh, the general proposal here is, to have essentially two different layers and two different protocols. First for, uh, for the repli replication within a partition. Uh, and it can be a consistency based protocol like Raft or something else. Um, and then the transactional protocol, which works on top of the, uh, which works with partitions as whole items basically. So it doesn't, the transactional protocol is not aware of uh, primary or backup nodes. It works with partitions. Uh, and within partition, we use this cons consensus protocol uh, to maintain consistency. Uh, so this actually creates a bunch of benefits. So first of all, we don't need atomic or transactional caches anymore because anything that happens within, uh, within partition uh, doesn't need the transactional protocol, right? So if you just update something that is within a single partition, we just use the consensus protocol. If we update something that is cross partition, then we use the transactional protocol, which is on top of it. So uh, we don't need to differentiate between atomic and, and transactional caches. So that's, uh, that, that's the first thing. And also, uh, if we use those advanced protocols, um, that do not require uh, global synchronization like we have, we can get rid of PME in the first place, which obviously creates, you know, uh, uh, stability improvements and usability improvements uh, for the product. So this is, um, this might be quite a big change. So it's a, it's a question uh, which release to include it in and when to do it, to do this change and uh, how to approach this properly. And also it actually requires quite a bit of an investigation as well. Um, it's an open question, you know, which protocol to use, um, how to um, apply those protocols properly to our um, specifics. So there are many questions uh, to answer. And again, as I said, this might be quite a big task, but I think it actually might be really valuable as well in terms of uh, stability, first of all, and also split brain protection. Well, my, my question is, uh, 
mostly around uh, probably the timeline because uh, this uh, this this sounds and looks like a, a tremendous effort. I mean, like uh, one thing is to clean up and improve probably high level APIs so inconveniences with the transaction protocol. But when we're talking about uh, consensus protocol support, it might be a long story. Do we already have in mind uh, any specific steps how we should approach with this transactional, let's say, APIs or overall rework? What what should be completed definitely in the uh, time frame of Ignite 3.0 and what uh, should be pushed to the 3.1, 3.2 versions of the release? Do you have any basic idea of how sh this should look like? So, uh, yeah, so this likely will have to be, uh, so this is a major change. Um, so this probably will have to be in a major release. Uh, again, whether it's 3.0 or not, that's, that's a different question. <laughs> um, uh, because as I said, I mean, it, uh, first of all, it definitely requires some investigation. So that's probably the, the first step that, that we have to take. Uh, just to make some decisions what what needs to be done here and uh, uh, what exactly needs to be done here, which protocols we want to use, how they should be applied, uh, whether we need to change the API or not. You know, um, there are a lot of questions here. Uh, it's one of those items where we have more questions than answers, I believe, at this point. Uh, it just uh, in the long term and uh, like in terms of you know. Um, I, as I said, I think it's a, it's, it's a valuable addition. It's a valuable uh, change. Uh, and it's uh, just basically, it, it will make Ignite, uh, uh, stand better in terms of comparison with other databases because there are databases that already use those protocols but because they, you know, they, they've been created just, uh, they're, they're just younger <laughs> and they had an opportunity to use those protocols uh, from, from day one. Um, well, and be, yep. Do you see this as changing for the users at all or developers or is it strictly under the covers? And then I guess the second part, if it's just strictly under the covers and not to diminish the amount of work, because clearly it's going to be a ton of work for this, but if it is strictly under the covers, does it need to be a major release? I guess I'm in favor of doing it because as you say, the number of times PME is problematic is, is probably the most, most frequent uh, challenge that we have with our customers. So I, I think it's super valuable, but I also don't want to slow down a 3.0 release, but if it's under the covers, do we care whether it's 3.1, 3 3.2, because the users won't be affected. Uh, yeah, um, so, it is mostly under the covers for sure. And it is possible that we can do something like that. Uh, it's just, um, again, we will have to see whether it brings any um, API, ch API changes or not. You know, it might force us to do some changes uh, or it might not, right? right? Uh, so at least, as I said, I mean, it kind of removes the atomic and transactional caches uh, and uh, I guess, simplify some of those things. Um, not that it's a huge issue, you know, we might deprecate late, let's say some, we might replicate this configuration property or something and just have, you know, <laughs> a single mode for everything or something like that. So um, yeah, so again, um, I think the first step here would be just to do some more investigation and uh, uh, make, some, make some decisions. Uh, we don't have to include it in 3.0 necessarily, uh, but we probably uh, should do this investigation as soon as possible to understand how we approach this and uh, to do some to do some planning. But generally, yeah, we, we're definitely on the same page here. I mean, uh, I, I also don't want to have like a huge change that would postpone the release uh, for, for a significant amount of time. Um, but at the same time, uh, I like the change itself. <laughs> uh, so we'll have to look for a proper solution. 
And I like this point, I like this, your closing um, word, because the overall goal, how we see this at the community, the overall goal of Ignite 3.0 is to simplify, the, 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 the very first thing is simplification of the APIs and the cleanup of our, let's say, legacy. Once, once you clean up the APIs, once you come up with the new configuration uh, format, and once you kind of decouple that serialization from the schema, right, what, what well, is already presented, then you uh, will end up having a new like foundation for the rest of the improvements. And let's say that if we are, if we see that everything is completed from the APIs and uh, uh, legacy perspectives, then we can probably release Ignite 3.0 and then build up uh, or change other capabilities in uh, upcoming releases. That's that's how I see it. I, that's how I see, let's say, the, the primary goal of Ignite 3.0, cleaning APIs and coming up with new schema format and configuration approach. Yep. All right, uh, let's, let's move on then. So the next one is the code deployment. Um, so the code deployment is um, uh, something that can also be simplified uh we have uh we currently actually have two mechanisms that are kind of that are separate from each other and can be used independently um that's the peer cost loading the p2p class loading and the deployment spi and the difference is that the peer class loading essentially loads classes one by one from from a client node that like initiated a compute for example or any, doesn't have to be client, but usually it's a client node. And the deployment SPI is just the storage that um, where, where someone can put some jar files usually, and those jar files are automatically picked up by the server nodes. And any classes that are within those jar, jar files are uh, being deployed and uh, can be used going forward by services or uh, computations or anything else. So, uh, so the peer class loading um, has actually a bunch of issues. It's kind of a neat mechanism for, uh, you know, demonstration purposes. Um, but in reality, it has certain issues. So first of all, it has um, sometimes it creates unclear semantics. It has a bunch of different modes and uh, quite a complicated configuration. And uh, the semantic of all, of all those modes and uh, um, how those modes work, it's not really clear and it's not transparent. So it all sometimes creates some weird behavior, especially when we load dependencies. Uh, if you have like a class that then uses um, some heavy dependencies, which has multiple jars, um, that can create issues because it will try to load classes one by one and at some point it might not work. And it's, it's really hard to understand why exactly it doesn't work, especially for a user. Uh, so semantics are not, are not always clear. Uh, especially when working with dependencies. Uh, and another issue is, another potential issue is, I'm not really sure, but I think this is a valid concern, uh, is that we actually load classes one by one. And uh, this might go against the modular uh, approach that Java has uh, in the latest Java version. So at some point we can, um, we can hit certain issues because of that, potentially. Okay, this is not necessarily the case right now, but this is the concern that exists uh, because if Java works with uh, mod modules and they have like a jar per module approach basically, where at least it's kind of jar based, you probably can have multiple jars in a module, but anyway, so it's jar based. Uh, we cannot really load classes one by one like this. Uh, because we have to work within a single module. Um, so essentially the proposal here uh, is to utilize jar-based, some kind of a jar-based mechanism at all times. 
So first of all, we want to have one mechanism instead of two. Uh, for you know, for for simplicity or for better understanding of what's going on, and jar-based mechanisms they seem to be much more explicit and transparent and uh, easier to understand, right? You say I have a jar file; these are my dependencies as well. Maybe I have like five jar files, and I just want to all those jar files to be available on server nodes, and you can explicitly tell the system to deploy. Um, those jar files. So if you look at, uh, this is kind of similar to what Spark does, for example. Um, essentially in Spark, whenever you uh, run a task or run, a, run, run, run some application or uh, you start a Spark shell, you can specify what are the jars you want to um, be deployed on the executors. And you can either just have a local jars uh, on your machine where, from, from where you uh, run this, or you can also specify Maven coordinates, which is uh, quite convenient, and then Spark will do everything for you. Uh, so there definitely should be like a tool or something, like we can use the Ignite CTL tool as well for this, uh, that I've shown for configuration, uh, that will explicitly deploy certain jar files uh, on the server nodes, and then you can redeploy as well dynamically. Uh, the deployment SPI uh, or something similar can also be kept in place um, as long as it uses the exact same mechanism, right? So just instead of uh, executing a command, providing some jar files, you will put those files into the storage uh, uh, so that they are automatically picked up uh, by the server files um, and deployed there. So it's kind of pull versus push, but the mechanism itself is the same. Uh, so there is no uh, IEP yet on this. Uh, this is to be created. Uh, I will try to create this sometimes this week, maybe early next week. Um, but yeah, this is also something that uh, we want to look at. Any, any questions on this one? Yeah, so could this... Um this new mechanism allow us to avoid needing to restart the cluster as often? Um, I think, I mean, it depends on why you have to restart the cluster. I mean, for compute, you, you, uh, you can't, we kind of have this functionality right now, right? So you can use peer-to-peer -peer class loading to avoid cluster restarts. Um, but it's just this one will make it a little bit more transparent and explicit, I guess. I guess my concern is it sounds almost the opposite because anytime you have sort of a file-based, jar-based approach and you want to have a running server, the rep, you know, the replacement of a jar always seems to, not always, but quite often seems to be um, stuck, right? Can you rip out the jar and running server and replace it with a new one? Um, Spark deployment as much as I like the dependencies and all that kind of stuff, it, the deployment seems pretty heavyweight, right? Because you're just sending a new job, a new executor, so that you're starting everything up from scratch all the time. Well, if you have a running server, you don't want to be doing that. So I'm just a little worried about the heavyweightness of it, but if you can dynamically replace the jar with the new version, um, then I guess that is a good basis. And then you know, with utilities, you can make it look seamless, uh, almost as seamless as peer to peer class loading without any problems with it. Yeah. So I, I guess, yeah, anyway, that's just my concern. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting point. But again, I mean, um, um, as much as I would like to have <laughs> uh, like uh, class deployment uh, based on individual classes. Um, I don't know, like, I mean, it, it, it definitely creates certain issues that are uh, not expected. So, and behavior that is not expected. Again, this is uh, obviously up to discussion. Um, I will create a discussion on the dev list and I will create a proposal um, and we can have more, more detailed discussion on that. Uh, so this is kind of a new thing. This is, this hasn't been brought up, I think, uh, on DevList yet. So 
like, um, I like the intent, and I, and I yeah. see the issues you're trying to deal with. And you know, if the, from my perspective, a, a jar, which is essentially like a packaging up of what you're deploying, I, I like that. So it's when you when it's on the server, that's what was deployed, not some combination of different things from various places. Um, my only concern is, can you easily replace that without pulling down the server? And if you can, then I think you may the problems go away and you start, you know, start with the jar and then start improving with your uh, utilities for deploying and redeployment and all those kinds of things. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's actually the last, uh, the last item. So the uh, binary packaging uh, and delivery, this is something, there is the uh, proposal out there as well for this. Uh, it's not full yet though. Um, there are some members in the community that are, um, I think they're working on the prototype or something. Um, just to make it a little bit clear uh, to understand what is proposed and what we're trying to do here. But generally speaking, um, we have uh, a little bit of an issue with um, uh, installation and especially with the upgrade procedures of Ignite. Uh, so how it currently works is that uh, you download a zip file, which has everything, including like examples, benchmarks, configuration files, tools and everything. Uh, and then this zip file, then you unzip it somewhere and that's your installation procedure. So an installation procedure is very simple and straightforward, but when you upgrade, you actually download another zip file that looks exactly like this, or maybe almost exactly like this. And essentially you have to somehow merge those together. Uh, because within the within this un, within this folder within the ignite home that you have there, uh, you can uh, you can do some changes, right? You can add your own jar files, for example, to the libs folder, or you can uh, you can add some configuration files, uh, or um, if you go to ignite.sh, it has some it has several lines that say you know uncomment this if you want to get this, right? Uh, so you can also update the Ignite SH file. Um, and there are some other things as well. Uh, integrations, some, some integrations I think require, you know, like, uh, uh, like copy some jars from one place to another or something. So anyway, so the, the point is that uh, after you download and unzip uh, Ignite, uh, this folder can actually be changed. And then you, when you upgrade a new one uh, to upgrade to the new version, uh, you have to somehow merge those together. And generally it is not a trivial task, right? Because you have to somehow replicate all those different steps that you have done before. Um, and you know, uh, there is no clear procedure and it kind of depends on what you've done there. Uh, so the, so this is this definitely has to be solved somehow. The uh, the exact mechanism is not clear yet, uh, especially if we go into details. Um, the, the 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 general idea is to have a more lightweight um, package that is being downloaded uh, that would have like a like a script or some kind of a tool that ignites CTL tool. Uh, that is responsible for not only like starting nodes and stopping nodes and updating configurations or uh, doing any other operations or actions, but it also is responsible for uh, for the dependency management and for fetching the required artifacts uh, for uh, for the modules that we want to use, um, and we basically can use Maven under the hood to achieve that, right? So we can always specify that, you know, if we need like a, a Kubernetes module, Kubernetes IP finder, you can say, I need the Ignite Kubernetes module and it will uh, fetch it from, from the Maven repository. So again, how this will actually look like exactly, it's a, it's, it's a little bit of a question right now. Hopefully, hopefully we will have 
uh, prototype soon and some updates in the, uh, in the enhancement proposal. Um, but that's kind of the general idea uh, that we want the, the whole installation and upgrade procedure to be uh, more automated and less error prone because the way it looks right now is um, uh, is not correct <laughs> in my view. Uh, so again, um, this is one of those items where we have a bunch of questions uh, to answer and uh, I would appreciate anyone who joins the discussion that, you know, uh, any, any feedback, any insight might be, might be useful here. Because that's kind of a, that's obviously an entry point to the project, and uh, uh, whatever we do here might have a great effect on the usability, um, which which is one of the goals, which is one of the uh, main reasons why we do all this. So, again, up to the up to discussion how we should do this, uh, but I believe we definitely should update this. We should you know we should change the way we deliver. Uh, the binaries and uh, uh, change the way the project is installed and is especially upgraded. Any any questions? Yes, we have a question from Ken. Uh, what's going on with ML? He asks. With ML, uh, it's uh, being I think developed. I can answer actually <laughs> because I've talked to model maintainer to Alexey Zinoviev who okay. is developing it at the moment uh, with a few uh, other contributors and I asked him to join the discussion about the next uh, major release and I hope that he will do that uh, in two weeks while he after vacation. Okay. Also uh, asked him to present uh, what's going on in ML at the moment and uh, where does he need uh, help uh, with developing. Uh, and uh, I think he will do that in November for the community. So uh, if you are interested in contributing to ML, please uh, just join the group and uh, there will be an event. We can go back uh, to joining. page 11 quickly. Yeah. Just comment on that. Uh, you know, I think there's a difference between the way you deliver and the way startup occurs. Because I, I think the challenge, you're, I think you rightly say that the challenge of merging, you know, the changes that people make, whether it be configs, edits to your S, uh, SH file, uh, work directories that are running, I think that's, you're right, those are key problems. But to me, it's not clear that it's the how you deliver those pieces or how those pieces exist relative to user pieces. So I'm not so certain that the, as much as I like Maven for delivering stuff, and I, I think we should support that, I'm not clear that uh, it's the distribution that's problematic. I think it's more of the, the startup, like so how Ignite CTL or future Ignite CTL if that occurs how Ignite CTL merges dynamically the other stuff. So I think the previous proposals go a long way to hopefully, you know, think, think about this as well. Uh, hopefully it goes a long way to making clear what you've added to what is in the base package. I yeah. like the unzip, you've got everything. Now what you have relative to what you used to have and merging those two, Hopefully, there's a there's another way to fix that. You know, just my just my two cents. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, it's not clear to me as well <laughs> at this point. So um, yeah, we, this has to be clarified for sure. And I think those things are related um, to a certain extent, at least. Um, but again, um, so there are. Um, uh, so I hope to have like a prototype sometime this month. Uh, that will clarify some of those things. And I, I guess, I, I think we'll go from there. We'll see if uh, there are any issues or objections or anything, and we'll see what where it goes. So um, I think we're running out of time here. So uh, just to uh, finalize this, so we have, so I've created this folder 
for uh, for the proposals that are related to 3.0. So here's the link. Uh, the three proposals that are already created are under this folder. So if uh, you want to uh, check them, you can just go to this folder and see what we have there. And uh, you know, if you have anything, if you want to create a new one, just go ahead and put it there. And also uh, I've created a, a, a Jira label, uh, which is ignite dash free for any tickets that might be related. So, you know, if there is some minor stuff um, that doesn't require a proposal and you want to just create a ticket and you want this to be included into three dot something, uh, please add this label so that I, you know, that I see it and anyone else can see kind of the list of tickets uh, that are related to uh, uh, to Ignite 3. Uh, and, you know, obviously, as I said, uh, let's discuss everything. Uh, so if there are any further questions or uh, objections or concerns, uh, please write on the dev list and uh, um, let's, let's discuss.